When 1837, Joshua Reed Giddings decides that he's going to run for the House of Representatives, the job opening came up at an opportune time for him. While he was a successful attorney and had made a fortune practicing law, he was involved in land speculation and nearly lost everything, almost had to file for bankruptcy. And the job, when his old mentor, was Elijah Whittlesley, indicated that he was going to leave Congress and that's when Giddings indicated that he would run for that spot. He was elected and he goes off to Washington, D.C. and the first sight that he sees upon entering the Capitol is he sees a slave auction and he sees an African-American gentleman that's being beaten to an inch of his life. And at that point, Joshua Reed Giddings looks upon this and says, how can this happen? How can this occur? He remembers back home to Ashtabula County and that there wouldn't be an animal that you would treat that way. And he resolves himself that he's going to seek to end slavery in our nation's capital. This was quite a big concern here at the time. He was a newly elected congressperson. Persons within his own party said, Giddings, don't do this. You can have a long career here in Congress and you need to make friends here with your Southern representatives. But Giddings remained steadfast. He always believed in the spirit of our Declaration of Independence and the words that all men were created equal. Giddings believed that. It's something that if you talk to Giddings throughout his life, it's something that he would talk about, about those words here in our Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal. And so literally, the very first thing that he sought to enact was to end slavery here in our nation's capital. Slavery is a state institution which it is neither the right nor the duty of the national government to intermeddle, to help or hinder it. And the concessions agreed to by the Founding Fathers were only agreed to because of the assurance everywhere felt that the evil was to have only a brief hospitality pending the adoption of measures for its peaceable but total extirpation. The very existence of slavery depends not upon the Constitution, but upon its violation. When the day shall arrive when Northern men will insist upon their rights, and refuse to contribute their substance for the maintenance of Southern slavery, that scourge in our land shall cease. The cause of human freedom is the cause of God. Congress enacted a law called the Altherton Gag Rule, and what that rule said is that you were not allowed to talk in Congress about the issue of slavery. If you did, you could face punishment here on the House floor. Giddings frequently violated that law all the time, at every opportunity that he could. And in November of 1841, there was a slave ship that was captured off the East Coast. There were a number of freedom seekers that sought their freedom on that ship, took it over, and nearly killed persons that were on that uh, ship here that was trying to enslave them. Created quite a controversy here in Congress about what should happen to those freedom seekers. Should they be returned into slavery? And Giddings, going back to those phrases, those words here in our founding documents and in that Declaration of Independence that all men were created equal, stood up for those freedom seekers and said that they were simply uh, trying to get their freedom, their God-given right to, uh, to freedom. He was censured for saying that on the House floor. Uh, there was a vote that was took here on the House, and they said, Joshua Reed Giddings, you have violated the Altherton uh, gag rule, and we're going to censure you here for your comments. Giddings tried to talk about why he said what he did. He tried to defend himself, and he was denied the opportunity to talk. Imagine, in our nation's capital, when we talk about freedom of speech, here we have a situation here, we have a member of Congress that is trying to say how he believes about this issue, and he's denied that. In disgust, Giddings resigns from Congress, and there had to be a special election that occurred here in Ashbula County to see who would replace Giddings. 
Giddings ran and he was overwhelmingly voted back into Congress. The strength of our community, the strength of our people that said, you're doing right and we want you to continue to fight for freedom here in the halls of Congress. It emboldened Giddings and he went back to Congress stronger than ever in fighting for freedom for all Americans. There are certain great and fundamental doctrines which lie at the foundation of our government. We profess to hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Tell me not that you hold the un these undying truths contained in our Declaration of Independence and at the same time sit here to estimate the value in dollars and cents of the body and minds of your fellow men. Those who founded our government declared their ulterior motive. That object was secure to all men, an enjoyment of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Are we today carrying out these objects? Here, sir, are 230 American statesmen legislating for the benefit of slavery. Statesmen in the high councils of our nation now deny that all men are created equal. Sir, we may have the power to overturn the practice of this Congress from its first formation, we may overthrow its established and time-honored principles. We may defeat the objects of those who frame the Constitution. We may subvert the essential elements of that sacred compact to which we are sworn to support. We may attempt to change the law of our existence, to deface the work of God and declare his image to be property. We may humble ourselves in the presence of those who hold the rod of terror over us, but there is a superior power that will hold us to strict account for our stewardship. Sir, when I reflect that I am now constrained to sit in this hall to legislate upon the price of man's flesh as property, I feel humbled. My soul shrinks from the impious sacrilege with loathing and disgust. As the representative of a Christian and moral constituency, I deny the right of Congress to involve them or me in support of such crimes. Let the power and influence of government be exerted to promote human liberty, to elevate mankind in his moral and physical being, and the honors of men, and the blessings of heaven, and the gratitude of this and coming generations shall then be ours. Joshua Reed Giddings was one of the longest, at that time he was the longest sitting representative in Congress. He served for a period of time of 1838 to 1859. And during that time frame, he had the opportunity to work and live with a number of our most famous representatives. One of those individuals was Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, he was on the House of Representatives from a period of time of 1847 and 1849. He only served one term here in Congress, but when he lived in Washington, D.C., he actually boarded with Joshua Reed Giddings at Mrs. Spriggs' boarding house. The two became very close friends. Lincoln admired Giddings. He admired the fiery spirit that uh, Giddings had here from Ashtabula County. But Lincoln always said that he was a little too radical and uh, he didn't fully agree with everything that Giddings had to say regarding his positions in Congress, but the two men respected each other greatly. When our nation started, one of the laws, first laws that was enacted was the 1793 Federal Fugitive Slave Act. 
That act provided for penalties for anyone who helped freedom seekers make their way up north. Originally, that law provided for $1,000 worth of fines for anyone, for each person that you helped uh, make your way to freedom, which then was at the Canadian border. Our nation has struggled here, or had struggled here, with the institution of slavery and whether or not it should expand or not expand. And one of the time frames that was really an important time here in our nation and where we were going to go was in the 1840s when Texas first became a state. When Texas became a state, Joshua Reed Giddings was very, very concerned because he saw this expansion of slavery that was going throughout uh, the South. Shortly thereafter, they found gold at Sumner Mill in California, and concerns existed here about what was going to occur with uh, lands out west, and would they come in as a free state, or would they come in as a slave state? Very big concerns that Joshua Reed Giddings had with this. Indeed, he was opposed to Texas being annexed as a slave state, and actually argued that we should get into a fight with uh, Canada 5440 and a good fight and take up additional land up north that could be utilized as a counterbalance here for Texas entering as a slave state, that we would have Oregon Territory and places in British Columbia that would enter into the nation as a free state. All of this was brewing up here. What do we do? Do we expand slavery? Does the abolitionist movement take hold? And there was a compromise that was reached in 1850, the Compromise of 1850, that did several things. One, it set forth what the boundaries were going to be for the state of Texas, as well as territories that would become the New Mexico Territory. It would enter California as a, a free state. And it created an idea here of popular sovereignty, that we would allow new states as they came in, they would make determinations on their own about whether or not they wanted to come into this nation free or slave. What about slavery in the District of Columbia? Well, this is an area where Joshua Reed Giddings won. When he first went into Congress, he was fighting against the slave trade occurring here in our nation's capital. And as part of the Compromise of 1850, the laws were changed to prohibit the institution of slavery in our nation's capital. There was also another terrible thing that occurred here with that Compromise of 1850, and that was an enhancement of that original 1793 Federal Fugitive Slave Act. Originally, when that law was enacted and said a $1,000 fine for each person that you helped to freedom in Canada, they changed the law to make the punishments much harsher. In addition to that $1,000 fine, for each person that you helped to freedom, you face six months imprisonment. So, by way of example, here in Asheville County, we had families such as the Hubbard family that helped freedom seekers make their way from slavery down south, up north. It's estimated conservatively that they helped 400 freedom seekers make their way to freedom. Tough questions to ask yourself here. Do you help your fellow man? Do you face thousands of dollars in fines and jail time for helping each individual? These were the tough choices that were being made by the citizens of Ashubilla County and Joshua Reed Giddings in the forefront, arguing our ideals in our nation's capital. The situation after the 1850 compromise became untenable. The year is 1858, and people from the Western Reserve, of which Ashtabula is a part of, they were so much against this federal future of slave law that they fought against it openly. One of the most famous rebellions that ever occurred here with respect to that federal future of slave law occurred in 1858, when the citizens of Oberlin saved a freedom seeker by the name of John Price. So that following year, in the spring of 1859, federal marshals arrested 37 persons to face trial in Cleveland for helping to free John Price. Giddings is alleged to have said the following at a mass protest in Cleveland's public square. We say today, down with the Federal Fugitive Slave Act, it is unconstitutional and void, and we will not obey it. I am aware that the Democratic press, with a hot terror, has represented me as willing to resist this law by violence if necessary. God knows it is the first time they have ever done me justice. People must consider these obligations as restraining their moral duties. 
They therefore very properly refuse to go farther than is required by the Constitution. Their sympathies are with the slave. Such is the ordained law of the human intellect. We cannot suppress the feelings of our nature. We cannot look with indifference upon the panting fugitive as he flees from bondage. We will not do it. We will receive him into our houses. We will teach him his rights and point him to that immortality that awaits him. Sir, our people know their constitutional obligations on this subject. It is useless to say to them that it is, the, it is their duty to assume the character of bloodhounds and give chase to him who is fleeing from a land of chains and tears. No, sir. Neither sympathy nor respect will they have for the slave catcher. We look upon him as a moral pestilence, a legalized pirate. We will not admit him to our dwellings. We will drive him from our premises. We will regard him as unworthy to associate with any portion of our race. So it's 1859, and John Brown is planning his raid at Harper's Ferry. He's going to go against the federal arsenal in Harper's Ferry and collect all the weapons, and he's going to pass them out to freedom seekers in the hope to start a revolution for persons to fight for their own freedom. This is a very famous uh, event here in our nation's uh, history. It was something that the South was like, look how terrible these abolitionists are. They're willing to start a civil war here to try to stop slavery. It's awful. One of the things that's not known here about that, or not well known here, is that John Brown met with Joshua Reed Giddings at the Congregational Church in Jefferson, Ohio. Just a few weeks before the raid, John Brown came to the church. We don't know whether or not he talked about what his plans were, and Joshua Reed Giddings denied that. But there is no question that the hat was passed around for John Brown and our parishioners and the citizens donated here money that was ultimately utilized here for that cause. After the raid at Harper's Ferry failed and John Brown is questioned here by the authorities, he's asked if most of his men during the fight came, where did they come from? And Brown admitted that most of them came from the Western Reserve and specifically with ties with Ashtabula County. It was also asked whether or not Joshua Reed Giddings had a part in planning the raid. And John Brown, he doesn't say no, he doesn't say yes. Instead, what he indicates here is that he shouldn't talk about it because if he denied it, you wouldn't believe him. And if he said that Giddings played a part in the raid, that it would do undue harm to a friend. So questions abound here. What did the citizens of Ashabula County know and what did Joshua Reed Giddings know about that fateful Harper's Ferry raid? But the impact here of that raid was important because after the raid, there were three individuals that were brought forth from which to provide testimony here to Congress about the raid. One was Frederick Douglass, who decided he wasn't going to go to Washington, D.C. and face possible charges for creating an insurrection against the United States. The other was John Brown, Jr., who sought refuge in Ashtabula County. And the third person that Congress wanted to talk to was Joshua Reed Giddings, and he and he alone went to Washington, D.C. to talk about what role, if any, he played in the Harpers Ferry raid. Joshua Reed Giddings denied that he had anything to do with the raid. He did acknowledge the situation of, of John Brown meeting at his personal church in Jefferson and that the hat was passed around and that money was collected for John Brown. But he denied that he had anything to do with the planning.
But with that said, he also indicated that he was glad that the raid occurred, that this was something that needed to be done, that this fight needed to occur to go against the tyranny of slavery. Again, Joshua Reed Giddens, throughout his entire life, believed in those words in our Constitution, in our founding documents, and in the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal. He risked his life for taking that stance. Shortly after the questioning that occurred in Congress, there was a bounty that was placed on his head from a newspaper in the state of Virginia, $10,000 for him presented down south to face trial alive, $5,000 for his head. Giddings played a huge role in Abraham Lincoln gaining the nomination to be president. In Chicago in May of 1860, the Republican Party met to determine who their candidate was going to be for president. There was not an agreement as far as who that candidate would be, and there was someone who came up to prominence that might be that particular person. And who came up was Gideon's old friend, those days of serving in Congress together, uh, Abraham Lincoln. And after the nomination, when Lincoln was finally able to secure the nomination, Giddings wrote a letter to Abraham Lincoln that says as follows. He goes, Dear Lincoln, I well know the manner in which you will be approached and the efforts of gentlemen to lay you under obligation. I therefore say that in regard to your nomination, I have done nothing by which positive duty demanded. Having said this, I proceed to remark that to my certain knowledge, your selection was made upon two grounds. One, that you are honest, and two, that you are not in the hands of corrupt or dishonest men. To the correctness of these assertions, my own veracity and honor are pledged. You will be elected, and if you will permit no designing men to lay you under apparent obligations, but keep yourself in the office pure and separate from the corrupting influences which have beset our public men, and exert its constitutional powers from to the purposes of truth, justice, and the elevation of our race, you will confer the only favor which your friend and servant solicits. Very truly yours, Joshua Reed Giddings. As mentioned, during that 1860 convention, there was a dispute here as far as who was going to be the candidate for president. The abolitionists weren't so uh, sure about Lincoln. Who is this individual from a slave state who grew up in Kentucky? Who is he to you know, champion our cause for the abolitionist cause? But Giddings was behind him. Behind the scenes, Giddings worked for Lincoln's nomination, and you may have heard about how, how Lincoln always told the truth. Lincoln always told the truth. And so in that statement that we read here about Giddings talking to Lincoln, it's like, we know that you're a truthful individual. This was important for Lincoln to get the nomination from which to rally the abolitionists, that Lincoln was someone worthy here of support. And Lincoln wrote back to Giddings to say how thankful he was and writes back to the Honorable J.R. Giddings and Lincoln writing from his home in Springfield, Illinois on May 21st of 1860. My good friend, your very kind and acceptable letter of the 19th was duly handed me by Mr. Tuck. It is indeed most grateful to my feelings that the responsible position assigned to me comes without conditions, save only such honorable ones that are fairly implied. I am not wanting in the purpose, though I may fail in the strength to maintain my freedom from bad influences. Your letter comes to my aid in this point most opportunely. May the Almighty grant that the cause of truth, justice, and humanity shall in no wise suffer at my hands. Mrs. Lincoln joins me in sincere wishes for your health, happiness, and a long life. A. Lincoln. Gives you some sort of indication here of how close those two men were. And here is Giddings talking about our Constitution, talking about the Declaration of Independence, seeing that we will have all men, and might I say all women, created equal. And here he finds in Lincoln as that person, that person that's finally going to get us over the hump and to lead our nation in a time of war to make sure that all of us are going to live 
in a land of freedom. As I look back, I can see that it was my task to agitate to argue for the right in the hopes that native decency would shine through the darkness of human nature and our nation would be better. No. I know that there is a great retributive justice. I did not believe, as many did, that we would come to civil war. But I knew that if it did, we would come through the flames, having been tested and made better for freedom and liberty. As for myself, I cannot but feel a conscious satisfaction of having done something for the foundation of our nation and hope that my work will last long after my name is forgotten.